Um, welcome everyone to the first official school committee um, meeting of the year, January 24th, 2022. Um, I, do I have a motion to start the meeting? Motion to start the meeting. All right, do I hear a second? Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, terrific, thank you. Um, uh, first, adjustments to the agenda. Um, I'd actually like to make an adjustment to the agenda. Just give um, a really brief staff appreciation at some point. Um, great. And Annie, where is that? Um, uh, where uh -huh. should we tuck that? For, perhaps right after public comment before we start presentations and discussion items. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, so let's move right into public comment. Um, as a reminder, public comment is limited to a three minute period of time. We may or may not be discussing that topic, um, but we are excited to hear from the public. So if you would like to speak, go ahead and um, raise your digital hand and we will take you off uh, mute. I'm still letting a couple people in from the waiting room, Humera, just so you're aware. Yep, I just saw um, some. Markowski. Yeah, Chris just came in and uh, another participant. Okay. okay. Um, and just as a reminder, for those of you who are just joining us, we are opening uh, the meeting to open comment, public comment, digital hand, and we will take you off mute so you can make comments. Okay, seeing no digital hands, um, we can move on to the next item of the agenda. All right, so um, Tara, you're up. Thank you. Um, so in light of kind of how things have been starting in the new year, um, and this um, pandemic has been going on for over two years now. Um, and given how challenging it's been since, um, you know, we've returned to school since the um, Christmas break, I just wanted to give a formal appreciation to um, our school nurses at both schools for how hard they've been working um, tirelessly, effortlessly, um, have maintained compassion and dedication to our students. Um, despite it being a really challenging time and sometimes probably a bit overwhelming at times, um, just wanted to give them a formal recognition that we appreciate their time and their dedication to the kids in the district. Um, it's never been easy to be um, a nurse in healthcare, and I feel like now is especially challenging time to be a nurse in healthcare. And I think more recently, it's really proved to be challenging to be a school nurse um, in this field during this pandemic. So just want to say thank you for your hard work and thank you for being there and showing up every day. And thanks for caring for our kids. Thank you, Tara. That was beautifully said. Um, our school nurses have been working incredibly hard. Uh, I, I just cannot imagine the, the load from the numbers that they've seen in the last few weeks. Um, I echo that appreciation um, as well. And I would just like to include thinking of them, uh, the parents who are nurses who are helping us, Allison Willette, Robin Sis, Kara Wade, Leanne Cook has also helped us. Um, that's the uh, weekly testing program is a tremendous amount of work and they also have helped with some rapid follow-up testing. So we wouldn't uh, be able to do this work without their, their assistance. So thank you to all of them as well. Great, thank you. Um, okay, moving on to the um, next item on the agenda, um, DESI DPH protocols and COVID data. Annie. So the hyperlink in the agenda takes uh, you to the weekly COVID dashboard. The school committee and the public are very familiar with the COVID dashboard. Something recently that's changed is that um, very recently we asked that parents of students who participate in any extracurricular activity enroll their children in the weekly, weekly pool testing program. You recall the school committee discussed this in December was actually a request that a parent sent to the school committee in December. 
At that time, when we looked at the data, we, um, one, looked at the very high rates of vaccination that we had in the district. Um, at Hopkins Academy, 87% of students are fully vaccinated. At Hadley Elementary, it's now up to almost 43% of students are fully vaccinated at Hadley Elementary in pre-K through grade six. We looked at vaccination rates last month, and we also looked at case counts last month. And when we met on the 21st, it is likely, I just looked back, I know I update the dashboard every time I get information about cases, but then there was most likely 18 cases district-wide to date for this school year. And today we're at 114. I'll be adding another one. It'll be 115 tomorrow morning or tonight before I leave here. So between your school committee on December 21st and this school committee meeting, it increased by almost 100 cases. Um, and so uh, it was with that in mind that when, again, parents uh, suggested that we look at this again, making uh, pool testing a requirement for participation in extracurricular activities, given the case, the increase in cases that we were seeing, um, it seemed like a very logical thing to do. I know for some people, there's some confusion about what that means. There are some folks who think that if a pool, so just really quickly for those who are not currently participating in the weekly PCR testing that is designed to pick up infection among asymptomatic people. If you're symptomatic, we would ask that you stay home, um, that you use rapid at-home tests if they're at your disposal. If you become symptomatic in school, we use rapid tests to determine as long as families have consented to it. It's only done if we have consent on file. Um, but if you're asymptomatic, uh, you would be, adults and students would come to school and this pool testing is designed, this weekly testing is designed to pick up cases where we have people who are infected and asymptomatic. Um, and so uh, we didn't, you know, there are some districts that have a vaccine requirement for students to partic participate in athletics and some extracurricular activities. We thought that it made sense, given, again, the significant increase in cases, to ask all families who have children participating in extracurriculars, and we didn't limit it to just athletes, that they would be the only ones, but any extracurricular activity that they would sign up for pool testing. Testing is not and can never be a requirement for students to attend in-person learning during what the Department of Ed refers to as structured learning time. So the 900 or 990 hours and 180 days that are required of instruction, we cannot make testing a condition to access that structured learning time. But extracurricular activities, we can set conditions for participation. Again, as you know, the other districts have, whether that's requiring participation in weekly testing or vaccines. I am in no way suggesting that the district have a vaccine requirement. But weekly testing, we can set as a condition. That is something that can be determined at the local level. So I just wanted to review with the school committee these data, why, in December, when we had this discussion, it did not seem necessary on December 17th. Again, when there were roughly 17 cases in the entire district or 18 cases in the entire district going all the way back to September to the start of the school year. But almost 100 cases later, it seemed like the logical and safe thing to do. So that's currently what we have in place. And I do know that the school committee has, uh, I've certainly heard from some parents, some of whom were very happy with the decision and some of whom are not happy with the decision. Uh, those emails that I've received, I've passed along to the school committee and I know that school committee members have also heard directly from parents and families. Um, so I just wanted the school committee to have a chance to uh, weigh in if you would like me to take a different course of action, I am I'm happy to do that. Um, I just wanted to be clear with 
why I made the decision that I made. And um, I'm happy to hear from the school committee regarding what you would like to see going forward. Um, Annie, thank you for that. I um, very clearly remember the conversation that we had where we uh, thought about whether we should make that a requirement of uh, sports and we thought, uh, well, heck no, why would we, you know, uh, just isolate this one group and penalize them? And what about all the other activities? But to see the numbers jump as they did and to not know how severe it was going to be, I feel like we, I feel like we made the right call. And, um, uh, or at least you made the only call you had available to you in light of these numbers spiraling out of control. I know that I, I'll speak just from my own point of view. My, my daughter um, was pretty unnerved to be surrounded with as many people who were coming down with cases of COVID and saying to admitting that they didn't test negative, whatever that means. I mean, I think that there, I, I heard that there were people who were sending their kids in despite all, be that all as it may, I think that we just have to take as many precautions as we possibly can because uh, this is after all a global pandemic. Um, that's what I'll start off by saying, but I welcome comments from my colleagues. Yeah, I think, um, you know, when we discussed this, we set out to have an, an equitable application of health and safety um, measures that are available to us for extracurriculars, all extracurriculars. And in my mind, I felt like um, it was a, um, you know, treatment that was the same across the board that applied some level of health and safety security that we could at least implement within our control. Um, and so to me, those were some of the underlying decisions of this. I don't, I also think obviously there are changes in seasons. We move, we, you talked about the increase of cases. We're also now talking to, talking about the shift of all of these extracurriculars for the most part are going to be indoors. Um, and so I think that there, there were some underlying rationales that drive this that also don't mean that this is, you know, forever for this entire spring semester. It is subject to reevaluation based on uh, what's going on in our community and in the state. Uh, so I think use the, you know, use the protocol and the, the measures that we have available to us. And I think that's, that's what you're doing. I'll chime in and I apologize. I had to step away for a second. So if I say something that's redundant, Heather, I'm sorry. Um, but I, I fully support um, the decision that you made, Annie, and just to tack on to what Heather just ended with, um, this entire pandemic, we've kind of had to roll with the punches. And every time we came to meet, something new was changing, and we had to just keep up with the most current guidance and do what seemed appropriate at the time. And um, this, this is what sees, seems appropriate at the time. And really from, you know, a school standpoint, it seems logical um, to do this testing when the goal is really to keep students in school, keep staff and students healthy so that the schools can remain open for education too. Um, so doing as much testing as many places as possible for as many people possible um, seems the best way to be able to um, catch those positive cases and mitigate um, as quickly as we can. So that way we don't have something where there's too many staff out and the school needs to close. Um, so it, it seems very logical and appropriate. And I thank you, Annie, for your swift action on it. Can I, can I ask some questions, Annie? So um, <clears throat> can spectators still attend these functions? Is it yes. sports or? So we're not saying spectators can no longer attend. That is correct. That's correct. The and only change is yeah. the only change is, is requiring our students who participate in extracurriculars to participate in weekly testing. And that's nice because I know other schools are limiting spectators or not allowing spectators at all. So mm -hmm. I appreciate the, the openness to that. Um, 
what happens if an athlete or a musician is in a positive pool? If you're in a positive pool, because we currently do what is referred to as in-lab reflex testing, the nurses who do this, Allison Robin, Kara, and uh, occasionally also Leanne Cook, what they they have got, they do this incredibly efficiently. Uh, even with the numbers that we have now, I think today we collected a total of 351 individuals participated in testing today. It's the highest number that we've had to date. And um, Allison asked teachers, what are you looking at in terms of students, uh, the longest that students might be waiting to get uh, to collect the specimen and give it to the nurses and maximum could be eight minutes there. And that's really, there are schools where students may be waiting as long as 45 minutes. So they have this as a well-oiled machine. Um, if a pool, so each person takes two samples, two swabs, one goes in a tube with perhaps five other swabs that's referred to as the pool. And they also put a swab in an individual vial. If the pool tests positive for COVID, then in the lab, each individual swab is tested. The only individuals that are required to isolate are infected individuals. If there are five people in a pool, so I'm in a pool today with, I don't know, five or six people, if that pool is positive, we don't take action until we know who the positive individual is. And then that person would isolate, the infected person would isolate. The other swabs in the pool do not, they're not infected. The goal now is to, to isolate people who have active infection in order to reduce the likelihood that they'll transmit it to others. So uh, I really do believe I can't imagine that there is a parent in the district who would want, if they knew that their child was actively infected with COVID or with any illness, that they would want their child to transmit that to adults or students, other students in the building or adults who work in the building. I simply cannot believe that there's a parent that would want that. Um, and so what this does is prevents that from happening. And we have seen that many, because we do have such high vaccination rates, I'm not implying that's the only reason, but I imagine it could be some of the reason that many students are not presenting symptoms who test positive and sometimes even adults. Sometimes they are, but not always. Yeah, thanks for that. One, one final point. So maybe you just touched on that. So I'm, I know you received this comment of just fundamentally parents not wanting us to tell them uh, requirements that their children must do, especially mm -hmm. something, you know, theoretically as invasive as, you know, a swab up the nose. How do you mm -hmm. respond to that point? You know, I just fundamentally don't like you telling me what to do with my child. Uh, I respect that point. I don't uh, look for arbitrary and whimsical ways in which to dictate how parents should manage the health of their children. But as you said, I think I did touch on this. I will reiterate, I refuse to believe that there is a parent in Hadley who could look me or anyone in the eye and say, if my kid is sick and as a result could get other children and adults sick, I, I don't care. I just don't believe that we have that parent. Um, that either I don't care or um, my the fact that you're suggesting or requiring me to do something is more disturbing than the idea that um, my child could infect other children and adults. Um, you telling me what to do is more disturbing than that idea. So I would prefer not to be told what to do regardless of the fact there could be a risk associated with that. I don't think that's the mindset of the majority of people. I could be wrong, but I choose to believe that it isn't. Um, if folks feel as though that it's invasive, um, I would strongly suggest, I know that Allison and Robin are always happy to talk to parents. I know they have been talking to parents and really please, they're the people running the program. Um, 
I do it every week. I do it every week. I don't feel like, um, you know, it's, it's quick. It doesn't feel intrusive. I'm not standing in front of a group of 10 people while they watch me take my nasal swabs. It is, it is quick. It is quiet. It is not intrusive. That's my experience. Um, and again, I would encourage parents to, to ask questions of Robin and Allison, uh, Kara. They have a lot of information and I think they can articulate the benefits far better than I can. But again, I would just say to a parent, is it res reserving the right not to be told what to do? Um, is that more important than taking a very simple, free, convenient, people all across the country are clamoring for tests. This is the gold standard, completely free, and it just takes moments every single week. Um, is it more important not to be told what to do? Or is it more important to do something that could support the health and well-being of others? I, I, I'd like to think that our families believe that the latter is far more important. Yeah, thank you, Annie. Good response. So just to make sure I understand, so we've seen what almost a fourfold increase from this month to last month mm -hmm. in cases. Um, it, from this month, and I just clarify, Paul, you'll say it that yeah. a fourfold increase. Last month was for the entire year. It wasn't just for the month. When we met last month, you were looking at roughly 18 cases from August 31st until December oh. 17th oh, okay. in one month. So for four months, you had total adults and kids, both buildings. And then now we're at almost a hundred more. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So a four or five fold increase in a month over that much higher. And then we're not saying require vaccine as other schools have. We're not saying limit spectators as other schools have, or, or say no spectators as other schools have. We're, and we're saying, please pull test so that we can catch spread early. Um, and I think one of the other ramifications is potentially we can continue to have spectators. We continue to have these extracurricular functions such that we don't see spread in them. So it seems like a reasonable step forward. Thanks, Annie. I appreciate the responses. Thanks, Paul. Ethan? Yeah, I'll come in. Uh, I'll just probably echo what everyone else has said. I think that, you know, my four and six-year-old have been involved in the pool testing from the beginning, and it is, it's seemingly about as, as easy as, as possible. I've never heard them complain about it. Uh, but I just think we've had to, I think as Tara mentioned, kind of roll with the punches these last two years. And I think at every step of the way, we've kept the the safety and health and well-being of the community of our students, our faculty, at, at the front of this, and I and I think as long as we continue to do that, um, I think we're making the best decisions for 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 this community. And I and I just I I applaud the work that we're doing uh, because I I think we're we're able to keep our schools open. Paul, to your point, we're able to continue to have sports with spectators, even though we've moved all these sports indoors and. Uh, you know, as long as we keep the school, you know, continuing to move in the right direction and operating as close to normal as possible, I think that's that's what we're looking for. Annie, do you need us to vote on any change no. to all this? No, just if you wanted to redirect me to do something different, I'd be happy to do that. That's really all right. Well, thank you for keeping a sure. close eye on this and keeping us apprised. Okay, uh, next item on the agenda is uh, the Hopkins Academy Student Achievement Data. Annie. Which, which does dovetail nicely into what we were speaking about. Part of uh, the testing is about keeping, of course, everybody safe. Students healthy, staff healthy. If our staff aren't healthy though, we don't have enough staff at work. We can't keep schools open. And I just, I shared some data that I'm grateful that uh, Ms. Camuso collected to take a look at what happened last year. We, she gathered data on first quarter grades and she put together first quarter grades and she started in 2018, 2019. So this isn't the entire year, it's first quarter. But if you look at 1920, so we closed schools on 
Friday, March 13th, 2020 is when we closed schools. So the first quarter of 1920, we didn't, we had no idea what was on the horizon. And in that first quarter of 1920, we had 15 unique students who received failing grades in term one. And the number of failing grades was 16, right? A student could have more than one. And then in 2021, when we were kind of in this remote in-person model, Hopkins, remember, presented the greatest challenge because moving children was a problem. So the high school presented much more of a challenge than the elementary school in terms of delivering in-person instruction in a typical way. In 2021, the number of students receiving failing grades in the first term jumped to 34, 127% increase from the previous year. The number of failing grades jumped to 83, a 418% increase from the previous year. Um, and now you see this year, term one, six students had failing grades. I'd also like to point out there are some other things going on, uh, tiered supports, uh, Michelle Wachowicz's work has been inter- instrumental. Ms. Camuso and the teachers have demonstrated incredible leadership because we're seeing a tremendous improvement even from pre-COVID. But six unique students, 10 total failing grades. So you see the decrease from the previous year. So I wanted to point these data out and it, it wasn't, this wasn't done intentionally, but it does dovetail into what's at stake here. You know, why it isn't just about arbitrarily trying to insert myself in people's lives and tell them what to do. What's at stake here is having people spectators. The basketball game is a lot more fun when people are there cheering children on. It's enjoyable. And just keeping the doors of school open because when in-person learning isn't available, some students just thrived but not everyone did. And when it's not an option, the stakes are incredibly high. So I just wanted to share these data with the school committee and there's no vote or anything else that's required. Thank you, Annie, this is really inspiring. Um, Any comments from my colleagues? They're amazing numbers, a dramatic decrease. And and so you mentioned a couple of things, Mrs. Watowitz and uh, mm-hmm. What else were you saying? Would, would, would you Just uh, in general, I would say that April Camuso and, and the educators at Hopkins Academy have worked really hard and demonstrated great instructional leadership and trying to look at data, identify when students uh, are not succeeding, what might be the root causes of that, creating individual individualized kind of support plans for students when they're struggling. And I believe that's what you're seeing, the fruits of uh, some of that work. It's inspiring to see the turnaround. So all, all the applause to all of the efforts that have helped with that from the students, the parents, the staff, just the system, it's appreciated. Mm-hmm. Great, thank you. Okay, moving on to the next item on the agenda at home rabbit antigen tests for students and staff. Completely voluntary. So this program, if people opt in, and today I sent a form to all families in the district. Right now I have 113 families. I could have more in the past couple minutes, but the last time I checked 113 families representing 171 individual students who have opted into the program and 88 staff. What this allows is for families We will uh, receive rapid uh, antigen tests, at home rapid antigen tests. We will distribute these to the students who have opted in to bring home. We'll let parents know when to be on the lookout for them. Every two weeks, a student who has opted in will get a test kit. The test kits have two individual tests in them, as well as instructions about how to administer. Uh, The hope is that in addition to the weekly pool testing that families would also exercise this other option of rapid at-home antigen tests. Now, we will not be collecting from families affidavits, when did you administer it? What was the result? The only thing that is required if a family opts in or a staff member is that they report a positive result to the district. We do not need to hear about negative results. We do not need to hear about exactly when the test was administered. The only thing that is required 
if someone opts in and you must opt in, I cannot send home test kits unless a family has completed the form. If you have any trouble accessing the form, if you have any questions, email me, call the district office, uh, call your schools, we can help you. If you opt in, you take the test, if you get a positive result, we do need that result. Um, and uh, so this is a wonderful program that again, testing is hard to come by and it's also expensive. It can be, I believe that these tests can go for between 20 and $30 at a pharmacy. I'm not exactly sure, um, but so this is free to families and staff. Um, and so please, if you're interested, uh, sign up because you have to opt in. Annie, a question. Um, mm -hmm. Will, how does the allotment work? Like, will you get, will the district receive a full allotment assuming 100% opt-in? Or do you have to say what percent is opted in? So I reported for staff, I already reported. I do, and this, I'm glad you asked that question. So I'm asking families, please make sure that you fill this form out no later than this Thursday. It's a very quick and easy form please fill it out by Thursday because on Friday, I need to tell the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, their testing company, the same company that's running the other testing that we do, I need to let them know how many kits I need. And they have said then that the kits will be distributed uh, or delivered next week, I believe. So the week of the 31st, but I need to let them know by Friday. Then we'll distribute them. People can opt in at a later date. They can always opt out of the program. And um, I would just, if there was a fluctuation in the number, I would input that data in the, in the testing company site. I was just wondering if you're allowed to say, assume everybody's going to opt in, get all of the kits that you can get, <laughs> hold on to the ones that are not being, you know, distributed to the folks who aren't opting in. And then you have some for if they choose to opt in later. I don't right. know. Yeah, so I, I think they might be, I think there's a bit of that, Heather. So when I signed the district up last week, I told them 100% how many faculty and staff we have and how many students we have. So they got that number, that 100% number. And then they want us to say precisely how many people have opted in every two weeks. And I'm not okay. sure, they may send us enough for 100%. It could be that they just want to make sure that we're very clear that this cannot be mandatory. It is not mandatory. Um, it is separate from the requirement we were talking about with pool testing for extracurriculars. This is entirely an, an opt-in. And one last question. Did you say mm -hmm. the number of kits is per student, not per household? Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. And this seems like such a no-brainer. Uh, mm -hmm. to, to be able to have students have the kids at home and not have to go into pool testing in order to mm -hmm. verify or, or mm -hmm. hide their suspicions. Well, so to be clear, this does not replace pool testing. We will continue no, to do no. pool testing. No, it does not. We would be doing both because our focus now is on trying to identify infected individuals, right? That's really our, our primary focus. So it's, it's both and. It's both. And the PCR testing is more sensitive than the, that the rapid tests are wonderful, but we would, we would do both. And then, so might this have ramifications? I know Amherst is discussing that this will have ramifications for contact tracing. Yeah, so I had already let families know and folks understand that um, the, the reality is people should assume that if, if they're in school, and certainly if you're looking at that, dashboard, you should assume that it's very likely that you are in contact with someone who has COVID-19. We do our best to try to catch people, right, through asymptomatic testing, through symptomatic testing. But I had explained to families in an email that the assumption you should make is that um, your child, if they're at school, has probably been in contact with somebody with COVID-19. So what we ask families to do, one, please consider participating in pool testing. That is one of the best ways to just constantly try to pick up positive cases. Of course, monitor for symptoms. And if your child exhibits any symptoms, keep your child home. And now we'll be able to provide rapid at-home tests 
that families can use at, at no cost. They'll be provided free to families. The other thing that we, we noticed is um, one, people should just accept the fact that we have a, a number of cases in the district right now, but also that in school, because students are masked, except for when they're eating, um, that students um, are spaced to every extent possible, that it's, it's immediately out of school that is really more of an issue. So, and there's, there's nothing wrong with this. I mean, I was in high school 8 million years ago, I get it, but kids leave school and they pile into a car together. So we can contact Trace all day in history class, but the reality is that then, then they see their friends and they're at, they're at their friends' houses and there's nothing wrong with that. They should be, they should be social. So it was not a good use of time for the nurses or for me. So this is a much better approach. This approach means that we're just focused on just consistently using testing to try to identify positive cases, even if they're not symptomatic. Great, so this is essentially replace any contact tracing you all have mm -hmm. done, which I knew took a lot of time. We should mm -hmm. also say too, that any family can go online at covidtest.gov and you get free four tests mailed directly to your house for free. That's right, thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, yes. And they are doing reimbursement through insurance companies too. There's some stipulations on that. And I think insurance companies are still kind of learning how to navigate that. Um, and then the only other thing I wanted to add was, Annie, I, uh, I, I think you put it in your form as well, but pool testing for students at school is on Mondays. So I think you put in there, the ideal would be to do the home tests on Thursdays. Mm -hmm. Really the point is to separate it by at least a few days. So that way you're not testing, say, if you pool test on Monday at school and then you do your home test on Tuesday, you might miss something that may not show up positive for a few days after that. So ideally is to spread it out a little bit so that you can get as much coverage over the week. Thank you, Tara, that is correct. Great, any other comments on this item? Okay, thank you everyone. Um, item D, update on Pathways Program, Hopkins Academy, Future Educators Pathway. Yeah, so lots of good news. We received a, our proposal for a future educators pathway was funded. It's roughly $14,000. This will allow individuals who are interested in becoming educators to uh, take courses free of charge uh, in the UMass Education Department to um, have a kind of designated pathway, just like we do with innovation pathways and early college high school. It will allow us to create kind of a future educators club or a place for folks to get together and even connect with uh, students who are in the School of Education studying to be teachers right now at UMass. So exciting. It's just one more example of having these pathways of articulated pathways of study and career experiences and real world, world experience and internship. So we're excited that we received that grant. And just while we're on it, we also were notified that we received funding for a math acceleration academy. I have been reaching out to families of children who could be eligible to participate in intensive math instruction during vacation if they chose to. That was roughly a $10,000 grant. And we were awarded a very competitive grant for social emotional learning. That was about $69,000. It will help us to implement uh, universal mental health screening to create protocols for evaluating the data from those screenings. And it will also help us expand and enhance our work in positive behavioral interventions and supports and social and emotional supports in both schools. Um, so lots of excitement on the grant front. There's about uh, $100,000 two weeks, which is nice. Congrats, Annie. Yeah. Your batting average keeps getting better and better. Oh, no. yeah, we're, we're doing you well get, this year. You got to keep a running tally. I do. Constantly <laughs> moving in the back, yes. Yeah. I, I think nice. that's what Chris has going on, right? <laughs> the list yeah, of grants. That's great. That's great news, Annie. Yeah. Specifically about future educators pathway. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, that's really just such a, a great thing to continue to 
forge partnerships with the university in particular. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, for young people, I mean, they say the best way to learn is to teach. To start early teaching is, um, is incredibly powerful. And so I love hearing about this, take a class and join a community through a club mm -hmm. aspect. Um, yeah. It's pretty great. Yeah, and we've noticed too, we have many students at Hopkins who asked to do independent studies and kind of teaching assistance, assistantships with teachers at Hopkins. We have a number of folks who are interested in, in teaching or working with teachers. And we have a surprising number of Hopkins grads and Hadley Public Schools folks who come back here looking for work. I mean, that's really our pipeline. So we're excited that we'll be able to offer this. It's pretty awesome. Thank you. Okay, item E, proposal for facilities audit. So this was a critical step that we talked about in September in order to get a more competitive uh, mass school building authority application. So Collier gave us a proposal to do a facilities audit. Uh, we went, Chris and I went with Collier's after we, um, I sent out and uh, form a survey to superintendents in the state asking if they had used, had anybody do a facilities audit what, whom did they recommend? So we got some great feedback and um, we followed the, the processes that we needed to in order to secure this particular vendor. Uh, Chris spoke with him today and the expectation is that, and there's a, a link to the proposal, what they would do in the school committee packet, but essentially it's what we were looking for, kind of a assessing Hopkins Academy from top to bottom and making recommendations and cost of repairs and cost of not repairing. So kind of analyzing, do, we, do you repair, do you renovate, what makes sense in this situation? And they anticipate that they will have that finished for us in early March and then we'd bring it before the school committee or perhaps invite them to present the, their report to the school committee. That's a pretty um, tight turnaround. That's pretty great. Yeah. Any questions on this? I thought it was a really thorough proposal. It seemed really good. Yeah. And a fair price, yeah. I mean, I think for what we're getting. And, then, and as you said, really, if we want to continue anything with the MSBA, we need to do this. Yes. Yeah, I agree. I thought clear. the price was fair and that this really sets us up for being able to really, you know, be knowledgeable when we're talking about the, the building mm -hmm. and the status of certain things. Yes. Agreed. What is the cycle, Annie? for MSBA applications and does this put us um, at- I don't think it will like put us in this year. Thank goodness that Paul told me to stand down in my enthusiasm. So even if they make their timeline and they're finished March 7th, uh, they would present to you in March. The, the massive renovation application for MSBA is due mid to late April. And it would require though, not only your vote, it would also require a vote of the select board. So it may be tight for getting a strong application this year. Um, I was thinking more so that it gives us a good amount of time to do a lot of the community development work and um, conversation building with parents and then ultimately the select board in order to potentially get the outcome that we'd like to before we put in what would be a big application. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I think that's right. Yeah, so it would, um, if I, it, realistically, I don't think I'd be looking to, uh, I, I don't see myself doing a really high quality application in, in four weeks time and trying to get votes. But the emphasis is more that's then plenty of time to prepare a really solid application for the for the following spring, which would be the 23, April 23 application. And to your point, Humer, I hadn't really thought about that, but it also gives a lot of time to be talking about the report with the community, with the select board, with um, members of the community, with students, with families, with faculty and staff. And it really helps set up that, that analysis of, you know, are we just talking the events is it, is it more, you know, what would it look like if we were to do a whole new building? You know, I think it sets mm -hmm. up that range of discussion from small individual fixes to, and, you know, as we've talked about before, we have a fairly well-maintained building, even though it's older and we've had a couple MSBA grants in the past, which doesn't necessarily set us up 
into the future, right? You know, given mm-hmm. that they have limited funds. So, but they've also mentioned too that considered a multi-year process. Like you, you'll have to apply mul- multiple times generally to get success. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Ethan, you were going to say something. No, I just was. I was just going to ask a question of: are, are, Is the expectation that they will suggest to us several different options, or kind of just lay out their findings and for us to digest? So I think I just need a minute to pull up that proposal and my monitor went dead. But when I go to, here we go. Um, So a comprehensive survey of all systems and components will be conducted and they identify specific projects. um, They identify and prioritize them. and they look at associated project costs. I think that they do take into consideration, I mean, fundamentally you have to ask yourself is the repair or the, is the cost of the repair and the benefits that you get from the repair or renovation, does that make sense or does something else make sense? And so I, uh, I think all of that factors in, right? So then, that's part of the discussion. They would present the findings and the report to the school committee. School committee can ask them questions and then the school committee kind of considers and deliberates on, all right, based on what we're seeing here, what makes sense. Great. Well, I'm really looking forward to um, seeing their work. Do you need a vote on this? No, we don't actually. We okay. just wanted to let you know, because you had already recommended this. The reason I say no is this is something that the school committee had set as a priority back in September. So we just wanted to let you know where we're at with this uh, identified priority. Great, thank you. Okay, sure. um, we are on to item F, subpay. I am actually at this point, informing the school committee, we made an adjustment because of even changes in, in minimum wage. So um, the sub pay, I'd like a formal vote from the school committee that um, sub pay for teachers without certification is $95 a day and with certification is $100 a day. I may be coming back to you next month. Um, I'll do an analysis of what the rates are all around us, but this, I would just like an immediate vote um, essentially approving something that we had to put into place just in order to make sure that we were keeping up with changes to minimum wage. Um, I do not have questions about this. Um, I'm wondering, does anyone else or do I hear a motion? I'm just curious. I don't remember where the rates were at. Uh, I think we were at, uh, 80. 590. Although if I'm wrong, Chris can chime in later and correct it, but I think we were at 8590. Maybe. Um, yeah, I think we were at 8590. Okay. And um, the only other thing I would like to add is that I would appreciate too if if you did come back to us and found that we were still not at level with um, surrounding districts to make sure that we keep ourselves competitive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I will. Great, any other questions? All right, do we hear a motion? So moved. Yeah, yeah seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion passes. Thank you, Annie. Uh, Moving on to item G, bus driver negotiations. We need to appoint school committee representatives. Um, Annie, can you remind us about this conversation? Yes, so we do have a teeny tiny unit of uh, bus drivers and they've reached out and sent a letter to, I believe to you, Humera, or I might've passed it along, requesting uh, to bargain because the contract ends just like all the other contracts ends this year. Um, so we need school committee representatives. Now we'll um, probably begin those negotiations. We'll wrap up teachers first, move on to unit D, and then we'll do bus drivers. Um, So probably March, early April. 
March, early April, and with the target of completing that by? Oh, before the school year ends. Okay. It's a, again, it's a very small unit and a pretty straightforward contract. I remember doing this one once and it was pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. Do I hear any volunteers for this uh, committee? So aren't, aren't uh, Ethan and I on a unit D negotiation? Is that correct? It, it, yes, yes, you are. Yeah. And I think- um, Sarah and I are on unit A right now. Mm -hmm. Yes. And ours and I, is not. Yours sorry, hasn't started yet. Yeah, ours we're going to wrap up the teachers, and then we've, we've got to you folks. Okay. I'm, I was just going to say I'm hesitant to commit to something that is that late in the spring, given my term will be ended ending after um, this this round. Wow, mm -hmm. that's the end of March. No, it's after. Um, town meeting. So I think it's uh, actually May, but given uh, the bus driver negotiations right. will start in April, I hate to commit myself to something if it goes longer than that. Sure. I'm happy um, to I've, serve as one of the members of the team. I'll need one more. I'm happy I'm to. Happy. It's, that's fine. You can, you can just keep on rolling. You go right from unit D and you'll just keep yeah, on going. <laughs> Ethan, I think it'll be the first uh, committee that we've served on together. There we go. Great. All right. Okay. Great. You, you don't need a vote on that. Uh, I don't think so. Okay. I think everybody here. I think we're good. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, Ken. All right. Terrific. Um, last item here is H, Superintendent yes. Formative. So good Department. news. This is not the ridiculous acrobatic feat that it's had to be in the past because DESE no longer requires that you guys, some progress, lots of progress, maybe we like our progress, maybe we don't. All you have to do now at the formative evaluation is take, I prepared a progress report for you. And if you have significant concerns and you wanna change in direction, that's really all you have to do. I'm not offended, but all you have to do now is throw a flag on the field. You, you don't have to do anything else. And you don't have to throw a flag if you don't need to. You can just say, steady on. And I have to say that, uh, you know, we, we spent two um, solid uh, afternoons of time together in the summer going through almost every aspect of the strategy and came up with some really good uh, aspects of it. And I feel like you're firing on all cylinders. I've uh, looking at what you've uh, accomplished so far. Uh, I'm very pleased. I have no flags to throw on the field and um, I'm going to ask my colleagues to chime in. I agree. I have no flags to throw on the field. I think you've taken into account the things that we talked through. Um, and you've also, Annie, I think, surrounded yourself with a really strong team um, mm -hmm. and modeled for them. Uh, I think the, the, the behavior and dispositions and expectations that uh, you bring to the role, that they are, they are seeing that in you. So I appreciate that and, you know, really congratulate you on building that um, strong and wonderful team. Thank you. All right. I see the grant, the grant number in there. I hadn't seen that before. The 1.1 million security. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice. That's impressive. It is impressive. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Good job. Thank you, Annie. Thanks. It's sure. uh, I mean, these last few years in particular, um, I, I, I just can't see how we're attracting a lot of people to the superintendent fields um, and the you represent really um, the best leader we could have had in this role and I'm appreciative of your work. Thank, so you. thank you. Thank you. And I, I will say that uh, it's easy to lead a team when the team is as talented as it is. So we are fortunate in this district. We have highly skilled administrators and we have excellent faculty and staff. Our teachers our educational support professionals, the people in the front office, they, 
they just do incredible, incredible work. So it makes what I have to do enjoyable and, uh, and it feels enjoyable and easy. Some days I may not sound like it feels easy, but it does because of, uh, because of those folks. So thank you very much. See how much easier this is? Maybe it'll do the same thing for the summative evaluation. <laughs> thumbs up, thumbs down, we're done. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay, onward to the business manager reports. Chris, are you there? I am here. Um, okay, so I have three reports for you tonight. The first is the expense report. Um, not really a heck of a lot to report here. Um, the only thing I would like to say is that we do have, um, there's a couple of items that um, I guess just need your attention. Uh, number one would be the telephone line. It's found on page seven. That is over budget and it's not really, um, but we were billed incorrectly. We, you know, when we put in the new phone system, um, it just got put in at HES and, for whatever reason, they build us differently than the other schools. So they've been alerted of that and they're working right now on, on correcting that. That'll bring it back down so that we're within budget again. Um, there are also some expenses that need to be transferred from this into grant accounts. You know, we got all these grants um, and some of them are reimbursement grants for expenses we've already had. So I have to do the transfers. I just needed to wait until the accounts were formed, uh, created in the town level. I just created them myself today, so we'll be able to transfer those expenses over. So it's actually gonna give an even better picture than what we see here. Um, but we are really right on target for where we thought we'd be. Um, no concerns at this point. And we've actually been able to do quite a bit of extra work um, in the district this year that, um, you know, just because these grants have saved us money, we were able to do extra things elsewhere. So that's certainly good news. I don't know if anybody has any questions on this particular area. I do not. Okay. Um, then we can jump on to the revolving account report. Um, these accounts are in great shape as well. Um, you know, all, all of them showing still an elevated level. Um, some of them higher than when we started the year. So, you know, like Hadley Kids, School Choice, um, and others, while not at the same level as when we started the year, are certainly in better shape than they've been for several years. So, Again, uh, nice to see in that area. Um, I'm not sure. I, I think it, yes, it was the, we, you see the, the lunch and the preschool accounts are lower, um, you know, in some cases, such as the preschool one, quite a bit lower than what we've seen uh, in the prior months. That was basically, um, December was one of those funky months where we had three payrolls. So, you know, it ended up being like, say, one on December 1st, one on the 15th, and one on the 29th. You know, when, uh, when we get paid every two weeks, we all love those months. You know, it's just like, oh, extra money this month. And um, so, unfortunately, for these accounts, it was extra expense in the same month. And uh, so, you know, that's just one of those things that usually happens a couple of times a year. So, when you have expenses of, say, $10,000 extra for one week's payroll, it's going to hit the uh, budget. But it all levels off over the course of a year. And, you know, by the time the year is up, we'll still be in good shape as far as those accounts go. So um, again, I don't know if anybody has any questions on the revolving accounts. Nope. Okay. Uh, then we can jump over to the grants report. Um, I apologize. This is not my fault though. The blame lies 100% on um, Ms. McKenzie who keeps getting grants and keeps forcing my font size to get smaller and smaller to fit on one page. So uh, I do apologize it's for that. It's a good problem to have, that, Chris. It is. Yes, it's it a is. a quality problem. Um, and, and this does not include the, uh, the SEL grant that she talked about today. Uh, and let's see, I think I put the other one in. The, yeah, the teacher diversification, diversification is in here. Um, but yeah, so this is, uh, is going to be an even tighter squeeze uh, you know, coming up in, in the upcoming months, but nevertheless, yeah, as you said, a good problem to have. And, um, you know, we are spending these grants down. The nice thing is that so far we haven't even had to touch the SU3 grant. Um, there are some transfers that need to be made to it, but um, that's going to leave us still in good shape uh, to utilize those funds next year as well, since it's a, a multi-year grant. So, um, 
again, Chris, do, we have I, to use the, do we have to use the SR2 this year? We don't. We actually can okay. use that next year as well. Okay. Um, so, and, and, you know, we won't use it all this year. So it's nice to have it multiple years in that one as well. Yeah. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions as far as this report goes. No questions. None on this, Chris. I'm just going back to the lunch, you know, how we can't have a meeting without talking about the lunch budget. And um, any, any talk about, we talked about this before, but it might this continue? Have you heard <laughs> anything on that? Of uh, the free lunches? Yeah. I have not heard anything yet. Um, I don't know. I mean, Anne, have you heard anything year. on that? Yeah. Oh, I'm about to embarrass myself. I have. Uh, Ms. Zach told me something, and I can't remember what it was. So I'll bring that back next time. Okay. I probably just said I hadn't heard anything, but I actually have and can't remember what it was. Well, if it had been bad news, extended, you probably would remember. Yeah. But I'll uh, I'll find out. I'll ask. I'll follow okay. up with Diane. There has been, I mean, not surprising, but there has been a real national movement of support for this program. Um, so it's going to be one of those things that it, if it does get put back down to, I guess, what we call normal, um, there's going to be a lot of disappointment. And yeah, we know how people hate to disappoint like that. So it, it's entirely possible that it would, uh, you know, there would at least be attempts to continue it. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Chris. And I, that's all I have. Good to see you again. We'll see, nice you, see you as well back next month. Okay. Uh, appreciate it. Okay. Uh, school committee reports, discussion items. Um, we'll start with finance. Ethan. Nothing to report again this month. All quiet on the, the finance front. Okay. Um, great. Um, and just a question about finance to Annie, um, the annual budget cycle, just refresh our memory when we'll see that the first of those uh, elements. So we sent over to the town a roughly a 3% increase to local, um, but we did explain to the town at that time that there are still so many unknowns. We're actively negotiating contracts, but the bigger unknown is energy right now. I don't know if you recall, that was around December. And I had said, if Chris and I had had to lock in that day, it would have been a 28% increase in energy prices. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping that we see the energy market. We're kind of hoping that we would see it settle down. I think I had a theory that's now feeling rather harebrained, but at the time it sounded good that they might settle down. And then you can expect to see a budget update at our meeting next month. And again, in March, we'll have the public hearing on the budget with the school committee in April, and then it goes to town meeting floor at the beginning of May. Great. Okay, thank you sir, for that. Hey, um, just on, on that, sorry, yeah. real quick, Annie, I know you and I chatted about the electricity. So I was just looking through the budget. Is it just the oil that's gone up? I think it's uh, both, but Chris knows better than I do because he talks to our person. Chris, are you still here with us? He has most contact oh, with LPD. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Um, yes, I am. Um, the electricity won't go up much because we have uh, a contract that locks in the rates. Okay. So, you know, there may be minor, we have the supply rate locked in. So there may be minor increases with the distribution costs, uh, but the supply rate side will be locked in. Um, it did switch over to a new one that's slightly higher, but nowhere near what I've seen in terms of other costs. Uh, you know, I, I've seen other districts whose contracts have come up this year. And there's a big jump on those. So we're okay. fortunate that we still have it locked in. And um, yeah. with the oil, yeah, that's that's just a tough one because the oil prices have gone up. And I think it's, it's really going to come down to just getting lucky and tracking, looking for trends. Uh, you know, the collaborative has a great website where we can see the prices every day and it goes back, you know, two or three months. So we can definitely track it and see trends. Um, unfortunately, at this point in time, the trend is going upward. So um, it's it's really it's it, just to continue to watch it, hope it turns downward, and jump on it when we can find something close to what the bottom is. I was reading Either up way, on, though it will be an increase. I'm just going to throw this out there. I was reading up on geothermal today. I guess prices on geothermal have come down yeah. substantially, and um, 
for like a after construction installation. And um, if we're looking at renovations, um, who knows? Who knows? Maybe we could get out of the oil insecurity mm. uh, market and get into something a little bit more stable. So I'm just consider the seed having been planted. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, Chris. Item B, uh, policy. Tara. Um, so we have not met since the last time um, we've had school committee, so we don't have an update at this time. Great, thank you. And item C, CES, Heather. Yeah, we have a collaborative meeting this Wednesday evening. So I will, um, and that's after our unit A negotiations, Annie, don't worry. So uh, I'll have a long night, but it'll be fun. And I will give you guys an update. Great, thank you, Heather. Um, item D, negotiations, and that's uh, Tara and Heather. So we're in, we're actively in, Heather and I are actively in negotiations with unit A. So we will have stuff to bring back to the table and review with you at some point when we're done. Terrific, thank you. And um, finally, we have item E, fields and capital, uh, Paul. Well, maybe I'll have Annie and Chris chime in. So we had um, provided a contract to Berkshire Design to give us a, an estimate and the layout for the next uh, phase two of the fields. So I actually don't know what their timeline Chris They're about Annie. three months out. And sorry, okay. I just sent an update over to CPA I and I that, included yeah. you on it. So the timeline that I think that we're looking at now is that we can anticipate that within the next three months, we'll get cost estimates for phase two and design work from Berkshire. Um, that will then allow us to go before the CPA and projects for next year for their next, I shouldn't say for next year. September 1st is when applications will be due for CPA projects that go to special town meeting in the fall. So we'll get the cost estimates, we'll pre present them in the design work, we'll present that to the school committee, perhaps Paul, Chris or I, or some contingency, some mix of that. We'll make sure we go before CPA with those cost estimates and that design work, we'll submit a CPA application. School committee sees that first. So I put together the application, I bring it before the school committee. You folks say thumbs up or thumbs down. Then we bring that to CPA in the hopes that CPA recommends that it goes to special town meeting in the fall. If we're voted in special town meeting, then we would go ahead and do the bid specifications. We would then go out to bid, award the bid, and be looking at breaking ground in phase two in summer of 23. Awesome. Thanks, Annie. Sounds like a plan. Does sound like a plan. I, I know at one point we talked about uh, cycling back with the CPA and um, giving them a, re a report of what we'd accomplished and what it looks like and maybe in, just a, a means to check in before asking for even more. Um, I wonder if we did that. And if not, I wonder whether we could between now and the time that that report comes out and what would that look like? So, I was sorry, go ahead, Paul. No, go ahead. I was gonna say, we haven't. I, I I've, um, haven't tracked any of their recent meetings. I think there was a while where they weren't meeting. So if there's recent or upcoming meetings, I know we've exchanged emails with them and communicated via email, but we had talked to Humera about actually doing a, a, a presentation to show. So I don't know, Annie, if you've had further conversations. I, I'm still up for that. I think it's a good they idea. They are meeting tonight. So um, I'll probably hurry. dial into that meeting, but um, I won't have a formal presentation. Um, and certainly then, yes, between the, f they don't meet all that frequently. They don't need to. I mean, really, they just ask people to submit applications. They review the applications and that's primarily the focus of their work. So they don't need to meet a lot, um, but we can certainly, we will have time when we get those, the design work. We will, we don't have to, we can, we can go with an update before going with the ask. We will have time to do that. Great. Yeah. I think the relationship building is just really really important. Mm -hmm. And um, if there is time between now and um, the time we get that report, and it's, you know, it's like two seasons of seeded grass, springtime is a really beautiful time. Uh, maybe there's a, there's a meeting and an invitation to come walk along the path. Um, it, for those, I went for the first time this, just this last 
fall. And, um, you know, unless you're, you're intentionally going to see, you're probably not going to experience just how beautiful it is out there. Um, and it's just how appreciative the Hopkins community is. So maybe there's a way we could do that and lay the groundwork. So, because I think this next ask is even bigger, is it not? Mm -hmm. Phase two is bigger than phase one. So um, yeah, great. All right, thank you. Um, We're on to seven announcements. Does anyone have any announcements to make? Okay, it's a quiet, quiet crew tonight. Um, action items. Uh, we need to approve the minutes for December 20th. Motion to approve the minutes from December 20th, 2021 meeting. And do I hear a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion passes. Approval of policy subcommittee minutes of November 22nd and December 20th. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, we need to approve the AP warrants for December 2021. I believe this is the one where Heather, you abstain. Um, so do I hear a motion to approve those warrants? So, so moved. moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And then finally, I believe this is the last one. Uh, no, it's not actually. Approval of, oh, it might be. <laughs> Approval of warrants for December 2021. Uh, and this is one that Paul, you abstain from. So do I hear a motion on this? Motion to approve the warrants from December 2021. Okay. Second. Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, terrific. We've already um, approved the substitute rate increase. Mm-hmm. And um, we've already appointed school committee members to the bus driver negotiations. Did we need to vote on that? Did we vote on that? I think you're fine with having appointed them. I have it here, Humera and Ethan. So okay, good. excellent. Um, all right, so the next meeting date is February 28th at 5 p.m. for policy subcommittee and then 5.30 for the regular school committee meeting. We do not need an executive session. So I should have said that in adjustments. We don't need it. You can we don't need it today. Terrific. Yeah. All right. So do I hear a motion to adjourn? Oh, wow. It's 642. That is right. Nice. That is. Mm-hmm. So moved. All Second. Right. All in favor. Aye. 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 All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night, everybody. Have a great night, guys.